Thanks, everybody. Uh, Y'all can go ahead if, uh, Kathy, you want to turn on your camera and mic. All right, go ahead. The floor is yours. All right, thank you. Well, first of all, I would like to sincerely thank Veterans for Peace and Garrett. Very much thank you for your abiding concern about drone warfare, about educating people, both through um, events like this, but also through your concerted action. Uh, Garrett, you having been a, 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 such an important player in shutdown Creech. And we're very fortunate today to have this opportunity to ask questions about who are the criminals and how can we de-weaponize drones and abolish war. To ask those questions today on such a crucial day when our friends in Afghanistan are suffering after long years of war weariness and we'll be joined today by people who have been deeply concerned about drone warfare, militarized drone use and usage of surveillance drones to constantly exacerbate the likelihood of war. My name is Kathy Kelly. I'm part of the um, campaign called Ban Killer Drones. And uh, along with Brian Terrell and others with Voices for Creative Nonviolence and prior to that Voices in the Wilderness, um, I, I have had an opportunity to be with people who have been deeply impacted by wars and can't escape. And it, it certainly is a sad day today as we reckon with the reality that even though over Kabul in Afghanistan, always there were four blimps constantly performing surveillance and absorbing footage about the lives of ordinary Afghans, even though there were innumerable surveillance drones launched, even though uh, thousands of analysts were looking at the footage, they didn't know very much at all about the hunger and the thirst and the displacement and the joblessness and the water shortages and the homelessness and the refugee crises. They didn't know much about the war weariness, all of which contributed to the reality we see today where the Taliban were able to take over the country one province after another. So uh, today we're joined by Brian Terrell, Brandon Bryant and Toby Blome. And I'm, I'm very happy to introduce each of them. And, and then of course, we'll be um, very pleased to hear questions and comments. We have 90 minutes to spend together and um, we must be very, very vigilant to make sure that we leave space for discussion about action coming up in the future. So I'm happy also to be joined by Nick Mottern, the uh, coordinator of Ban Killer Drones, who has done so much to uh, bolster our awareness and also to bring into the light of day the realities of Daniel Hale, who is now imprisoned awaiting transfer to Butner, North Carolina. When we ask that question, who are the criminals? I think we can all be in agreement that Daniel Hale ought not be treated as a criminal. He ought to be thanked. So um, Brian, I hope we can turn to you next. Um, Brian is somebody who uh, is often on a farm in Malloy, Iowa, where he tends to goats and sheep and chickens and crops. Um, but that gives him time also for uh, meditation and thought, and he has poured thought and research into um, many general questions with regard to war. His research has taken him to war zones, to refugee camps. He's been to Afghanistan many times, um, is ever since 2011. And um, Brian has also, since 2009, been an integral part of challenging drone warfare by going to the places where the drones are being operated. Because he had entered into Whiteman Air Force Base, uh, he spent six months in federal prison uh, as a result of his education and outreach. And he also, in 2009, was part of a group vigiling outside of Creech Air Force Base, which then led to a very unusual trial in as much as the judge was so moved by what 
the defendants representing themselves and very much led by Brian at that point were saying, the judge said, you know, I'm, I'm going to need four months to think about the verdict to this case. Well, we all need to keep on thinking about the verdicts on all of us as we try to grapple with our accountability for what drone warfare is doing and how the reality of drones really makes it easier for people to go to war and how the winners of this war are the people who make enormous profit out of producing drones. So thank you, Brian, for your time together with this panel and for, um, I know this is a Zoom sandwich for some of us today <laughs> because we were also on a panel early this morning. So welcome to Brian Terrell. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. And uh, yes, greetings to, uh, I, I can see I'm talking to many good friends and people that I've worked with on various projects um, and uh, uh, especially happy that, that, that Brandon Bryant is with us. Now, when we began this, as Kathy said, uh, 2009 was the first real protest of uh, drones, weaponized drones in the United States. And um, such weapons had been used very limitedly uh, since 2001. Uh, and um, Obama was just, President Obama was just coming into office and, and the drone assassinations had not yet become a, something we knew about or much less a cornerstone of US foreign policy. We were guided then um, by our, uh, more by our guts and by our hearts than by any hard information we had at that point. Some of us had been to Afghanistan and other places and, and talked to drone victims and, and had, uh, uh, you know, we had enough information to know that, 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 that killing by remote control was wrong. And, and we acted on that. Um, some of our friends and allies back then cautioned us, um, might there be something, might our protest be misplaced and might there be something to this? Uh, President Obama had said, his words that, that, that by narrowly targeting our action against those who want to kill us and not the people they hide among, we are choosing the course of action least likely to result in innocent life. Um, since then, we know that this is a lie and we know the aptness of our protest. It's been proved in a large part because of the courage of whistleblowers like Brandon Bryant, who's with us here this evening and also of um, Daniel Hale, who, who is now in prison. Um, we and the whole world owe them a great debt of gratitude. They're showing us the human cost, both in the places where these drones are deployed uh, among, among their victims there, and also in the hearts and psyches of the, of, of the young men and women who are uh, assigned to, to operate these drones. Um, since then, too, the drones have proliferated dramatically in their number and reach. Um, more U.S. drones are flown over more foreign countries by more U.S. Per personnel. 2001, when all this started, the U.S. and Israel were the only nations known to have operational weaponized drones. Um, March 2020, the Center for the S S Study of the Drone reported an estimated 102 nations have active military uh, drone programs, seven more than the year before, and six more uh, pe having pending drone plans. Also, increasingly militarized police departments are acquiring drone fleets, um, as well as the US Border Patrol, US Marshals, other civilian agencies. And they are used, um, you, know, you know, famously, uh, uh, drones being used by the US Marshals in Washington DC while there were Black Lives, Lives Matters protests that were not used on January 6th when there were, when there were uh, white uh, protesters storming uh, terrorists, storming the, the, the Capitol building. Uh, and we know that in, um, I think we know of only four victims of a drone strikes who were friendly fire victims, as they say, who were not people of color. Otherwise, the, the countless number of victims uh, have all been. 
all been people of color. And this is happening in our, in our police departments as well as, as in our military. There's also, uh, we're also moving closer and closer to uh, artificial intelligence. Um, the, uh, a few months ago, General John Murray of the US Futures Command, US Army Futures Command, they have command of our future, told an audience at the US Military Academy that swarms of robots will force military planners, policymakers, and society to think about whether the, a person should make every decision about lethal force and the new autonomous systems. And he asked, is it even necessary to have a human being in the loop? Now the US uh, and its allies have mostly been using still with so many new things on the drawing board, the assassinations of, with, the, with the drones and predators are, are mostly what we've been doing. But um, last November, uh, the war in Nagoro Karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan had uh, acquired drones from Turkey and Israel and used them in actual combat. Uh, you know, the the, the, the uh, Washington Post, November 11th, called this a game changer. The, 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 the war had been changed forever. Uh, the Azerbaijan drones targeted Armenian Nagorno-Karabakh soldiers destroying tanks, artillery, air defense systems, providing a huge advantage for the 44-day war and offering the clearest evidence yet, this is from the Washington Post, how battlefields are being transformed by unmanned drone attacks rolling off assembly lines around the world. Uh, one expert said, um, if it were not for these, uh, combat drones, the war, that war simply would not have taken place. Um, who are the criminals? As we're going, we're seeing what's happening in Afghanistan. And since President Biden came in talking about uh, the, the uh, disengaging from supporting Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen, and now with Afghanistan, and it's the same you know, the same uh, proviso is that these wars are transforming and they will be used, you know, with drones and with, 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 with uh, B-52s, with bombs. Back last spring, when it looked like the Biden administration was going to be cutting back from arming Saudi Arabia, the CEO of Raytheon made an announcement. Um, he reassured the investors of Raytheon, saying that not to worry about President Biden because war is not going to, peace is not going to break out anytime soon. And that the area, he's talking about the Middle East, would continue to be a place of solid growth into the future. So we're seeing a, a, a transformation of, of war going on now. And the, uh, the biggest fear of these profiteers is not uh, unending war. The biggest fear is not the welfare of the people of Yemen. Their biggest fear is not what's happening on the ground to people in Kabul right now. Their fear is that peace will break out and you know, who are the criminals? Now, a part of what we need to do, um, you know, Nick calling, calling us together to, um, as with the bans on, on uh, landmines, the bans on nuclear weapons, that uh, there should be a international treaty um, to ban to, you know, to, to ban weaponized and surveillance drones. And this, this really is essential. We have no delusions that this is going to be a panacea, that, that uh, uh, just as with the, the um, new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, which was ratified by enough nations to make it go into force last January, uh, is a stepping stone toward it. It's, it's a tool that we can use.
and a ban on nuclear on, on, on weaponized drones is not going to replace the activism we've done. And it's not going to be something, not going to be solving our problems. Uh, but they, it can be useful. The, 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 for exa one example is the US um, has never uh, ratified the, the, the ban on land, international land on ban on landmines. But we've cut back ex it, very much. Uh, the, 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 the approbation of it is, um, you know, is international uh, reaction toward anti-personnel mines because of the the uh, the you know, expressed in the ban has uh, has stopped the United States from producing. We've not produced uh, landmines since 1997, and millions of stockpiles have been of mines have been destroyed. So we're uh, Toby will talk to you about uh, uh, Creech Air Force Base and the and and the the upcoming protests there. And today, as Kathy said, some of us were on a on a call. Uh, activists from around the United States and Germany, uh, and with a, with a present situation, asking people to go to drone bases uh, sometime in the next week. We're looking at August twentieth as as uh, as a target day, but around that uh, of going to um, going to drone bases and saying. Uh, stop bombing Afghanistan and uh, bringing all this up. Um, international law, when it, when it, it you know, it's, I, I, I've been in court many times arguing about international law, even, even as an anarchist. And one time in November, 2011, uh, there were 31 of us on trial for a protest at Hancock Air Base in Syracuse, New York. That happened the spring before. And we had the honor of having Ramsey Clark, former US Attorney General, come and testify for us. And very often judges just slough off international law. It doesn't matter, I don't wanna hear it. But this judge was, was fascinated. He might've heard about it in law school and he was grilling Ramsey Clark himself and just, Honestly, I think honestly curious. What about the Nuremberg principles and these other laws that apply to drone warfare? He leaned over the bench to Ramsey Clark and said, this is all interesting, but what is the enforcement mechanism? Who is responsible for enforcing international law? Ramsey Clark pointed at us 31 defendants on the bench and said, they are and pointed at the judge and said, and so are you. So for an international law banning the use of weaponized and military drones and police drone surveillance, we need the work of lawmakers, diplomats, attorneys, judges, executives uh, from the, and the various nations of the United Nations. Uh, they will need to be stimulated by the work of grassroots roots activists. When there is such an international ban, history has shown that without public pressure, sustained public pressure from, you know, that, 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 that these laws will have no effect. The, the uh, enforcement mechanism of international law, the enforcement mechanism for a coming ban on, 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 on weaponized drones will still be us. So look at our, our website, uh, bandclerdrones.org and uh, find your local drone, <laughs> Uh, drone base, there are so many around the country now, um, and be there with a sign on Friday, if you can, and uh, come to Creech in October. Thank you. Well, Brian, thank you very much. Brian, before we go on to Toby, um, I wonder, there's one question in the Q&A box, and I also wanted to just say, would you want to make any comments about your recent experiences in Germany? I know you went there mainly with um, protest of nuclear weapons, but Elsa Rasbach had been telling us that actually Daniel Hale and the film National Bird um, have been quite known in Germany. And, and there, there is a possibility that the Germans do feel accountable uh, for um, weaponizing 
uh, materials that the Israelis have, have, have sent them and, and creating drones. And, and there's a chance of putting some of that on hold. Uh, did you have any sense when you were there of a, um, a heightened sense of accountability or responsibility within the German public regarding drone warfare? Um, yes, and if, if in the question and answer time, uh, Elsa might speak to speak to that more. But but uh, no, clearly a higher level of understanding and concern about about. Uh, nuclear weapons and of climate change uh, than, than, than we are, uh, you know, than, than we are finding among, amongst our neighbors. Um, so uh, yes, it was, a, it was a very difficult time um, in Germany because while we were there, the, uh, we were there and very close to where all the flooding was going on uh, due, to, due to the uh, climate change. And we were seeing uh, the uh, uh, tornado uh, fighter bombers spewing out uh, 13 tons of CO2 into the atmosphere uh, every hour that they fly, and these these planes are practicing for the end of the world uh, for for dropping German planes dropping U.S. bombs on on uh, on Russia. So I, I think that, that there's a there, there's also a, a concern among Germans about being used. Both with these nuclear sharing and with their their role in the the drone wars uh, at the Ramstein base. Um, okay, thank you, Brian. There's one other question, and this is: um, Does drone warfare lead to blowback against Americans? In other words, does it radicalize people in places that we target? And that's from uh, Greg Corning, I believe. Yeah, thank Can you. Can you speak to that? Yes, definitely it does, and the 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 the, the um, you know even uh, um, General Stanley McChrystal had said that uh, back when he was uh, uh, still the uh, head of U.S. forces, NATO forces in in Afghanistan. He told Rolling Stone he gave the number, the estimate. Uh, we uh, make ten enemies for every one that we kill. Uh, with these drone strikes, and it's um, it's it's disturbing that as as saying about what's happening in Afghanistan now is so predictable that it's hard not to see it as deliberate, and so these these drone strikes, um, they it's so predictable that they would they would radicalize and, and reports from Yemen from Somalia uh, that you know the anger against the United States is uh, um, is is more and more palpable uh, that that it's almost uh, you know if you're in if if you're an investor in Raytheon or Boeing the idea that these policies are creating more enemies is not such a frightening idea. You know, it's because it's it's it brings in as as the the, the CEO of Raytheon said it it's 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 growth it's growth you know we can we can we can make more uh, we don't need to worry the United States pulling troops out of Afghanistan because there will be drones and there will be B-52s and there will be blowback and and the, the the frightening thing one thing that frightens me as I think of this is that the um by any any account of looking anyone who knows anything about international law that they, they, they all agree that these these extrajudicial executions that the United States is carrying out away from battlefields um, killing people no matter how horrible somebody is if they're not engaged in but combat they are protected under international law the, the worst criminal being killed without a trial, is still a murder victim. So we're breaking the law there because these are not legitimate targets. Unfortunately, our drone bases, which are you know, in uh, outside of Las Vegas, they're in suburban um, Syracuse, they are in, in um, uh, uh, residential neighborhood in, in Des Moines, uh, the, the, the civilian airport has a drone the National Guard is dry, is flying drones right now in, 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 in my own state. 
These are, however, civilian, uh, these are, however, legitimate targets because uniform members of the military from those places are in combat, that they are carrying out combat missions. Um, so as, as the drones proliferate, and some drones are now uh, um, uh, cheap enough that almost anyone can buy them. And, and we hear about the, the uh, in, in Yemen, uh, people are making drones um, uh, off the internet with 3D printers, that, that sooner or later, um, there will be blowback here. And I'm afraid our drone bases will be maybe, maybe the targets. So we have to, for our own sake as a country, not just for our integrity, not just for our souls, but for our safety, um, for our security. You know, these, these drone bases are a, are a threat to our security. They're not ensuring it. They are killing people in, in, um, in Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, Yemen, uh, and they are killing people here because of the robbery of resources and for the, you know, for the potential blowback. Thank you, Brian. Well, our next panelist is like Brian, somebody who has been very, very committed to going to the drone bases. She says that it's her effort to put her body where her heart is. And Toby Blame has been exemplary in insisting that we have to care about the drone operators as well and, and try to find ways to engage them, to draw them into uh, a commonality in our uh, rejection of the idea that you know, it's, it's okay to sit around all day waiting to find out which person to kill in which place. And, and, and so Toby has been part of organizing consistent and growing efforts at Beale Air Force Base in California and at Creech Air Force Base in Nevada. She um, became involved uh, in 2009 with Creech Air Force Base and then in 2012 went to Pakistan with Code Pink to meet with people who were the survivors of drone attacks. And Toby is a, a major organizer of Code Pink and Women for Peace in the uh, San Francisco area. Um, her activism has certainly um, brought her in contact with many, many other activists, and, and we're fortunate today to also know from her what the group is, Shut Down Creech is envisioning for um, upcoming actions. So, uh, Toby, thank you so much for taking time to be with this panel today. Welcome, Toby. Sure. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I first want to just start to acknowledge the Ohlone people um, who are the caretakers of the land that I live on in the Bay Area and to remind people that 95% of their people were killed by the settlers. It's pretty disturbing. And I want to express incredible gratitude for Garrett Ruppenhagen who, and that's Veterans for Peace who uh, allowed space for us to be on this panel today and look forward to more vet, Veterans for Peace flags flying at Creech this fall. Very exciting. We love to see those doves waving in the wind. And um, I wanna also just say I'm honored to be on this panel with uh, all three of my, my panelists who have contributed in a really important way to help to make this world a better place for all of us. I wanted to make a, a few comments about drone warfare on, one is I, I wanna urge people to actually not use the word drone warfare. I sometimes stumble on it myself, but it really isn't warfare. It is really institutionalized murder and it's a terror program, assassination program. Um, we call these missions, these drone missions, combat missions, but they're not combat missions. There's not fighting on two sides. Uh, people are just being killed on one side. That's not a battle. Uh, the whole world is not a battlefield. We should never accept that concept. And um, people are being killed with drones as they're driving on the roadway with their families. They're being killed while they're attending funerals and wedding parties. Uh, the most sacred of human rituals. Um, and uh, they're being killed while they're attending schools. Um, 
and, and mosques. It's, it's abominable what my country is doing in the world. And we need to rise up uh, against this injustice. And in, inherently it's an, a racist program, just the idea that other people in the world don't have a right to a trial before they're executed is just uh, unacceptable. And, and lastly, the most uh, important to remember is that the targets of our drone program are the, the people that are most vulnerable, the poorest communities of the world that have no way to defend themselves, they're the defenseless. And uh, Creech Air Force Base is home of the hunters hunting the most defenseless people in the world. Uh, we need to rise up. And it's a very secret program. And I wanted to share something I learned from uh, an interview with Chris Hedges recently, who interviewed Jesslyn Radak. Um, she's the famous lawyer who's been representing all the drone whist whistleblowers. And in that interview, uh, she talked about the reports that the drone uh, operators get whenever there's a mission reporting how, how many deaths, how many people were killed in drone missions. And the numbers she said were oftentimes it, it can be as many as 1500 or 500 in a strike. And I had never heard that before. I'm, I've got a big question about it. Maybe Brandon can answer my question. Uh, the largest I've ever heard was about 150, 160, but 1500 in one drone mission, uh, 1500 people. And then these uh, operators are given rewards, uh, congratulating them for how many people are killed. And she shared one comment by uh, one of her clients. And she said that that person had uh, responded, this is totally perverse that I would get rewarded for killing 500 enemies in an action when children are being killed. And um, I wanna, I want to go and address back the question, who are the criminals? Uh, we all know that, you know, our government is made up of a lot of criminals. Uh, but there was a quote by a journalist. I, I gave uh, Edward Snowden credit for this quote, but I misspoke. It's actually by a journalist named Nick Gillespie. And he said, when exposing the truth is treated, treated as committing a crime, you are ruled by criminals. And uh, I want to honor people like uh, Julian Assange, journalist, and was um, a whistleblower in his own way by uh, revealing a lot of truths, hidden truths. And um, of course, Daniel Hale, Brandon Bryant, and especially um, Edward Snowden, who may not ever return to his country again if we don't change our government. And um, so when we realize we're being ruled by criminals, we have to ask ourselves, well, what do we do? What strategies do we use? And to always remember that. And so I reflect on the civil rights movement and I've been reading some on the uh, Montgomery bus boycott as well as the Freedom Riders. And um, I urge people to watch a film. At the end of my talk, I'm going to put in the chat, the link to this film if you haven't watched. It's called Freedom Riders. It's quite a moving, documentary, the people who participate in that campaign. And um, looking and studying at these two campaigns, the Montgomery bus boycott and the Freedom Riders, I, I looked at some of the commonalities because they were really impactful in changing the segregation laws that existed in the Deep South. And what, some of the characteristics of their campaigns where they were committed to peaceful nonviolence as a powerful action to gain change. And, and I'm a big believer of that. They, their campaigns involved sustained pressure, not just doing one action and that's over, we go home, but actually a long carried out pressure on the people, the institutions, the systems that are directly or indirectly responsible for the injustices. And that's, th those are the kind of approaches we need to take, something that we can sustain over a long period of time. They were well organized and orchestrated with strategic approaches. And there was a unity in their action that was very empowering and gave them strength and courage. And in particular, the Freedom Riders, uh, Black and whites joining together to take risks against the violence that they might be subjected to. And uh, some of them did 
get treated very violently, but luckily none of them got killed that I know of. And they had success, huge successes in their commitment and their work. And they were working to interrupt business of you as usual, saying, no, we, we can't tolerate this anymore. We need to stop it. And they had great courage, extreme courage. Even when they had fear to go to prison, they risked arrest and some of them did. And they came out of jail feeling stronger and more empowered. And I wanna remember Claudette Colvin, a 15 year old girl who nine months before Rosa Parks was arrested, a 15 year old black girl had the courage to stay in her seat on the bus when a white man asked her to get up, she went to prison. I don't know if she was the first one to do that, but she was a, a 15 year old girl with incredible courage. And um, I'm blanking. Did I talk about the interview with Braddock? I did, didn't I? I did, I'm sorry. So now I wanna move on to Shut Down Creech, a call to action. We've been doing Shut Down Creech for 12 years now. We followed the lead of the 14 creatures who led the way in uh, making us aware of the drone program. And I'm very grateful for all of them. And uh, what, what is Shut Down Creech? It's a call to service to our country and to the world. Um, it's a call for a national mobilization to ground the drones, a call to come out of our shells and stand up for the defenseless our global brothers and sisters living under the terror of US drones. It's a call to stop the obscene criminality committed by the US government and the military in the guise of national security. At Creech Air Force Base, there are 600 pilots and 350 operators working out of just Creech Air Force Base alone. It's probably the most important drone base in the country. They commit on average six strikes a day, according to a CBS report from two years ago. It may be much more than that. It's also secret, we don't know. But why should we do this? Well, when I look back at a, a film, Sur No Sur, a beautiful documentary about the Vietnam War and the veterans and the uh, people who were still in service, who organized secretly and in many ways, uh, in many ways, they organized against the Vietnam War. Some of them fled to Canada. Some of them uh, published pamphlets, distributed them on the base. Uh, the, the military realized at some point they could not continue the Vietnam War if they didn't have an army that was willing, a military that's willing to, to fight. So that's a lesson for us that going to the bases is valuable, trying to reach the hearts and minds of the soldiers flooding into the base, thousands of soldiers at, Cre at Creech, civilian and military flood into Creech Air Force Base every morning and afternoon, they come out. It's a call for um, peaceful civil resistance to be willing to say, you can't do this anymore. This is so criminal, so hyena, so wrongful. We are going to put our bodies in the road and say, no, you can't do this. And it's an effort to educate the military and the civilians driving on the highway about what Creech Air Force Base is. We want to model peace and we provide a, a safe environment. We try to a nurturing environment for people who come to Camp Justice. We uh, welcome you to our extended Creech family. And um, we have a lot of fun in between the the vigils in the early morning and the afternoon when they're coming out. We do lots of fun things to help build community and team building. And if you wanna find out more, there's a webinar that we just did. It's available on the Vets for Peace convention schedule at the very bottom. Uh, we urge you to watch that um, and go to shutdowncreech.blogspot.com. Think about coming. The dates are September 26th to October 2nd. And, um, and also as Brian, Brian said, uh, we have a new, new uh, website, Ban Killer Drones. It's an effort to organize the global community against these horrific weapons. We urge you to get on there and sign the petition, get all your friends and family to sign the petition. We want hundreds of thousands of signatures. And um, as, as Brian also said, we're a group that's now becoming more connected in a network. We're forming a network 
our national work against drones and we want welcome you. So um, we're asking as a first action to do something at a military base this week to try to oppose the horrible bombing that might be happening or is happening as we speak in Afghanistan. We don't want our friends, our family in Afghanistan to be bombed any longer. So um, there's so much to say. I, I know I probably went over my 10 minutes, but um, I just, um, I wanna actually close with a quote from Daniel Hale. He wrote a letter to the judge he, he took tremendous risk to, to reveal the truth about the drone program. We learned so much from what Daniel Hale revealed. Letter to the judge before a sentencing hearing, he said, I am here because I stole something that was never mine to take. Sorry, I didn't think I'd get emotional reading this. That was never mine to take, precious human life. Please, Your Honor, forgive me for taking papers instead of human life. Daniel Hale should be free right now. It's a, it's a travesty of justice that he's in jail. And uh, I ask everybody to rise up, join us. Um, if you can't come to Creech, start organizing a protest at your own military bases. It's not just drone killing we're opposed to. It's all killing. We need to de demilitarize our society. So um, thank you, nice to be here. Oh, thank you, thank you so much, Toby. You know, um, I'm reminded that uh, there was a time during the Vietnam War when a group of activists um, as marginalized then as we may feel we are now went to the place where um, draft information was being stored and they, they stole it. They took it out in the parking lot and they dumped napalm on it. And um, Daniel Berrigan said, excuses for the disruption of the good order of the day. Um, and, and he said, uh, we could not, we, we, we burn paper because we could not burn children. And uh, I think uh, Daniel Hale has certainly maintained that vision saying, I, I stole paper rather than steal lives. Those weren't his lives to steal. So we, we have certainly had a, 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 a very worthwhile witness. Um, Toby, are, are you anticipating ways that people who can't get to Creech during the shutdown Creech week might be particularly um, uh, supportive of, of, of the efforts? Um, yes, thanks for asking, Kathy. Um, we are asking people who cannot come to shut down Creech to organize actions across the country in their own communities, either at a close military base, a drone base, or a non-drone base. We're asking people to organize uh, actions locally in, um, in, within their cities. And uh, we're asking people to take the theme of fly a kite, not a drone, because that's the uh, Af Afghanistan tradition in their culture to fly kites. So it's a, a really beautiful image, a positive image. And um, we'll bring Crete, kites to Creech in, in the fall. And uh, I love the idea of, of kites flying all over the country in support of the people of Afghanistan, uh, stop the bombing of Afghanistan. Uh, it's almost been 20 years now, it's been enough, yeah. Well, um, Toby, thank you for bringing the message before the legislative branch of our country, the judicial branch of our country, the executive branch of our country, and uh, the court of public opinion. Uh, you, you really do hearten us for the, the struggles ahead. Uh, and um, the mention of Daniel Hale, of course, helps us then segue into our time together with the third panelist, who is Brandon Bryant. And Brandon was probably one of the people who first brought to our minds the notion of whistleblowing in relation to drones. And he, he did it at a time when I can't help but think it must have felt a little lonely because there wasn't you know, a whole lot of infrastructure out there to support Brandon. Um, and yet he, he hasn't put down 
the uh, the accountability that he felt when he first began to testify. Uh, Brandon uh, it has also been very supportive of Daniel Hale. So um, as we ask ourselves, who are the criminals? We're particularly grateful to have him here with us today. Brandon had been um, with the United States Air Force, a um, somebody who operated the camera, or you might say the sensor on a drone. And he was uh, in Germany and eventually he, he went public with his uh, revelation of his own trauma and, 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 and how he, he simply couldn't continue to do what he was called upon to do. And he ultimately gave testimony in front of the German parliament in 2012. And in 2015, he was the recipient of a, a very prestigious award from Lawyers Against Nuclear War, which was given to him in Germany. He's also been the subject of several films. Uh, so th his education capacity has really been very broad and, and, and deep. Uh, so Brandon, we're, we're grateful to have you with us today. And um, if you could turn your camera on, uh, then we'll be joined by Brandon Bryant. Uh, I cannot start oh. my video because the host has stopped it. Ah, <gasps> oh, that host. Um, <laughs> I, I wonder if we could get some help from Colleen or anyone who is a host who might help us allow um, Brandon to turn his go. camera on. There he is. Well, wonderful to see you. Thank you, Brandon Bryant, for joining us today. Uh, thank you for having me. I, uh, um, I didn't really know what I was going to speak about since it's been a while since I've spoken to everyone, but I'd like to acknowledge Veterans for Peace and Garrett for hosting this. Um, I met Garrett at a Veterans for Peace conference a few years ago, and we had a pretty intimate talk conversation about the differences between snipers and drone operators, and, uh, you know, what, what the training entails and what the professionalism entails. And I always find that uh, conversation a very important one to reference, because um, Toby talked about educating the military in her speak and I'm, I'm unsure of what the, uh, I know what you intended, Toby, but as, as someone who was in, in the seat and I know that my reaction, if you had been outside the base uh, protesting um, while I was there, I wouldn't have taken very kindly to it because I knew what I was doing and I didn't want to be shamed in, about it. Um, the, thing that the military needs to be educated on is not what they're doing, but on uh, taking control of what they do. Um, because it's not the, pe the, pe the people who sit in the seat are not the people making the money. And if we're going to talk about the criminals in this, we need to talk about the, vi the victims. Um, we need to talk about how we're a panel of white people with no people of color and no victims here. We need to talk about that the criminals that are the ones that get away with this are the CEOs of the corporations and the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the politicians that have uh, profited from this the entire time. It's not the, the, the drone operators and the personnel are just as much a victim as anyone else. And it's not like they could pick up their things and go work at Walmart or McDonald's. Um, they're part of a special class of people called the warrior class. and. Uh, even though I acknowledge that drone operations are um, inherently against the spiritual and philosophical aspects of the warrior, um, they've done a lot of good as far as keeping uh, the guys on the ground safe. And um, even if we were to acknowledge like Sun Tzu's The Art of War, Sun Tzu acknowledges in the very first paragraph that war is evil, but he says, here's how it's done. And if we were in this war to actually win it, which we can say today we are not because the uh, Taliban have taken over all of Afghanistan. Uh, if we were in it to win it, and if we had the, the righteousness behind it, drone, drones would not be um, an abhorrent weapon. But instead, <clears throat> like Toby said in Daniel Hale's letter, I was another person who took life. I took life from Afghanistan, the people of Afghanistan. And that was one of the things that I, I've been cursed with is the, 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 
the souls of the people that I had participated in this with. And uh, today, uh, August 15th, 2001, 27 days before the anniversary, 20th anniversary of 9-11 will be a day that all Afghanistan veterans remember. And a lot of people on forums and that I've personally uh, been in contact with um, talk about how this, what's the point? You know, what was the point of us doing this and going over there? Are we really protecting our country? Are we really protecting the people here? We see that in the last year and a half, the pandemic, the same people that profit in war, the same ones that profit off of the misery of the people of the United States and who has really profited from it. If we want to point out the criminals, the criminals are the ones that have profited from misery. And it's across the board to the citizens of the United States, the victims of drone warfare and the warfare overseas. And we really need to be um, straight with that. I think. Um, we're just in a really bad position right now and we need to figure out what the strategy is and how we're actually going to be effective. Um, the, uh, the fact that Germany is no longer uh, buying drone weapons from Israel or the United States is a thing that I'd like to credit to um, Lisa Ling and Sean Westmoreland, uh, their diligent hard work as whistleblowers of uh, a different sort, um, being different parts of the same machine than I was a part of and being able to use their intelligence and knowledge to, to fight effectively. Um, you know, uh, I wanna acknowledge Julian Assange. I met Julian, um, I gotta spend a couple hours with him and just hanging out. Uh, I think that he's a great guy and what he has done is uh, shown us what the average person can do in order to uh, try to expose things. And because Julian's a citizen, he's not a government agent. He's not um, a, a bought by a big corporation. He's just an average guy who saw that there was something wrong in the world and he did something about it. And it doesn't matter what people think about his personality or his mindset. He did the best that he could in the situation that he was in. And Daniel Hale is another exemplary person as long, along with Reality Winner who simply saw something was happening. I, I can imagine what any of those people were doing in their chain of command. Like they probably went to their chain of command and been like, hey, this is pretty messed up. And their chain of command is like, eh, uh, yeah, whatever, we're gonna continue doing it because this is what the people above us want. And so they took the only route that was available to them and that was to the public because in essentially the public people are also the bosses, you know, us as, white people have probably benefited the most from this, uh, even if it's like tertiary or secondary, like from the, from the meltdown that comes. Um, like I, as, a, uh, as a white man, I uh, didn't face jail time because of the actions that I took were not in violation of the UCMJ or any US law or code. And part of, I know that if I was a person of color, I would have been, uh, excuse my language, fucked. <laughs> like, like I would have, I would have, I would have been ended uh, six ways through Sunday. And, um, you know, we have to figure out what we're going to do to be effective. And sometimes just sitting here chatting is not going to be effective. It's, it's a, it's good to put out ideas. It's good to think about things and it's good to connect with people. But we really have to say, what actions are we going to take um, that are effective? Going to jail is not effective. Going to jail is just paying the government to do paperwork about for us, right? You know, how are we going to be effective and not put a burden upon ourselves and our friends and our family? Uh, someone's asking what actions are strategic. I guess if we want to say tactics are the direct actions that we take personally and strategic actions are what we can do together in order to move in a certain direction. And the way that we can move in a certain direction is to, we need the military drone operators on our side. We need people that are, um, mom. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, we need people that are actually, um, you know, involved in the process on our side, because if we just sit there and make people 
mad at us and irritate them about us. That's going to turn them away from us. And at worst, it's going to let make them do nothing. And there's a great quote that says that evil perpetuates in the world, not because evil men do something, but because good men do nothing. And there are a lot of good people in the military. Um, I was one of them. I was a good person in the military. And I think that even though that I participated in the life and death struggle uh, in a perverted manner, I'm still part of the good people that eventually recognized what we were, what was, we were doing is wrong and did something correct about it. Um, it's like the waves in the ocean. We got to be, we got to be those waves in the ocean and um, not worry about uh, not worry about what we're doing, but just be the thing that's doing the thing. If that makes sense. You know, we can't be we can't be attached to the fruits of our actions, the things that the, the consequences of what we're doing. We just have to be doing something. Um, yeah, I, like, honestly, if you want to connect with the drone operators, have a freaking um, like a bake sale. <laughs> like you would have more effect doing a bake sale in front of the squadron than maybe laying down and upsetting people not being able to get to work simply because, um, you know, the people that are going into work, they have to be there. If you're, if you're blocking the entry and exit to a place like Creature Air Force Base, the people that are doing the job are either having to stay after shift and they're angry because they're tired and they want to go home and spend time with their family, or they are trying to come into work and they, they're embarrassed because they can't replace their, themselves. And while we need to get these people to, be, to really acknowledge the fact that there's no glory in drones and it's a disgusting thing, um, irritating them is going to just, it's not effective. And I, I say that uh, from the bottom of my heart with my own personal experience that if I was still doing that, I've reflected on it, if I was still doing this or if I was the person that I was doing it and someone was outside the base and prevented me from going to work, or making me trapped on base and having to wait there uh, until the demonstrations were over, I'd be thoroughly pissed and I wouldn't be willing to listen to anyone that was saying anything about what I was doing. Um, is it, um, I guess that's kind of what I wanna say. If that's effective, I'm open to questions. Okay. Well, um, I just wanted to check in with the Q&A and invite anybody who has further questions for Brandon, um, or if there's any clarification of thought that we could um, explore, that would be fine. And um, Daniel, uh, sorry, Garth Selfield has written in the chat, I believe Daniel Hale, elected to go to jail over continuing to kill people. Um, well, I, well, if you want to think that, uh, so Daniel Hale didn't elect to go to jail. He broke a law that needed to be broken. Um, he stole papers instead of wanting to steal his funds. He honestly didn't have to go to jail. Like had he elected to go a different route, you know, he probably wouldn't have gone to jail, but he purposely broke the law because the law needed to be broken. If we actually uh, say that there's no, like him going to jail, he didn't break a law, anything like that, that means that we would ignore the law that was broken that, it, that needs to be violated, right? Like the law itself is written, it, we have to, if we, if we wanna take a step back and look at the philosophy of law in the first place, the laws that are created in this country are not a restriction on the average citizen and the person. The laws in this country are made for like, this is what the government is allowed to do, right? The constitution of the United States isn't the government shall allow us to have freedom of speech. It's the first amendment is the government shall not infringe upon the right of speech, right? The second amendment is not that we shall be able to carry weapons because the uh, government allows it. It's the right to defend oneself against tyranny with any technology that you have, right? It's the government shall not infringe upon. It. So uh, one thing that just needs to be pointed out is that we have to recognize that the laws are wrong and the people that are following the laws are 
building those laws and creating those laws so that they cannot be held accountable for what. Mm -hmm. Okay, Brandon, um, thank you for reminding us of the first and second amendments. Congress shall make no law to abridge the right of people to assemble peaceably for redress of grievance. Uh, and we, we surely do have a, a, a grievance. There, there is some mention in the chat of um, a desire to see if Toby would like to respond to, to Brandon. Toby, are, would you wish to do that now? Yeah, I would very much so. I, I appreciate Brandon being frank. Um, I was actually expecting Brandon to talk more about Daniel Hale than about uh, what we do at the bases, but I think this is a good venue for us to have a conversation about it. Uh, I know that some of the drone whistleblowers uh, are opposed to our work at the bases. I don't think all of them are, but I, I've not had an opportunity to sit with all of them. And um, I want to say that I want to address the comment that um, that go going to jail doesn't do any good. I, I think that is um, it's not showing an awareness of uh, the incredible work that the civil rights activists did. And it, they didn't do that work because they wanted to go to jail. We are not a bunch of people that want to go to jail. The, the uh, incredible violence that's being committed on people in places like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, are, are horrendous crimes against humanity. And we are trying to stop those crimes. And just like the 15 year old girl that had the courage, she, she had enough, enough self dignity and self respect to say, I don't accept your white man's law. I have a right to sit on this bus seat, 15 years old. She challenged and she stood up and she went to prison, she went to jail. And many, many civil rights activists went to jail. They didn't want to go to jail. We so one thing that you need to understand about the difference between what you're doing and what the civil rights activists were doing is that the civil rights activists were uh, standing up for their own right to be acknowledged as human beings and you going to jail, you're not fighting for your rights. You're fighting for someone to acknowledge you. And that's the very big difference is that I don't see as someone who has, who hunted Anwar Awalaki and watched President Obama kill both Anwar Awalaki, his 16 year old son, and then watched Trump kill Anwar Awalaki's eight year old daughter. I don't feel like us going to jail for protesting in that manner is effective. It's not comparable to the civil rights movement. It's just not, you know, we're not, we're not fighting for our right to be able to sit on a bus or to go and uh, be accepted as human beings. We're fighting for other people, you know, and I, 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 I'm sorry, but upsetting the drone operators, like I've got ties and listen, I listen to the things that they say because they trust some of them trust me, even though we don't necessarily get along. And whenever they talk about code pink or people protesting outside of the bases, it's just all they get is anger. They don't want to listen to you. And in fact, I've seen some people that see you're protesting outside of Creech Air Force Base and they want to kill people while you're out. They're that kind of people. You know, those are the kinds of people that are psychopaths and you're never going to get to them. But if you irritate them and push them in the direction of wanting to hurt people because you guys are doing something to irritate them, you're not even affecting policymakers. You're not affecting the people that make the decisions. You're affecting people like me and Daniel Hale, who are the bottom rung of the totem pole, who have to go in and do a work because we couldn't afford to do something else. We're trying to get our education paid for. We're trying to support our family. There's a reason why they call it a poverty draft to go in the military. You're protesting against people who are also in a poverty situation and in a troublesome situation and you're not going to jail for them. You're not going to jail for the rights of people in Afghanistan. You're going out there and making a spectacle of yourself that is just upsetting people. You used my face. You try to use my face outside of a base one time without even asking me, how do you think that makes me feel? You know, that, that makes me not want to cooperate. And, but I've given you opportunity after opportunity to, to do so and, and act respectively. And I'm asking you in this public forum, to think of the soldiers as people. You know, they know that they're, what they're doing is wrong. They know that there's a bunch of fucked up shit going on and they need your support, not your criticism. Okay, well, I just want to emphasize that we very much are people that care about the soldiers. We're very much aware of the moral injury 
that they're sustaining by going into that base every day and continuing with the killing. Are you sure? Have, because I almost killed well, let myself. Me, let me just finish, Brandon. I, I think this is a really healthy conversation. Um, Kathy, did you want to introduce? No, I just wanted to say, let's hear Toby out because I think that's important. I think we all agreed to that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we we are very well, we're well, very well aware of the fact that the work that these human beings are committing are are doing on the base is damaging to their own souls, and that's part of the reason is we're we're asking them to really think deeply about what they're participating. Now, I'm not having any fantasy that I'm going to change the mind of a psychopath. I have no idea out of 900 operators and pilots that are on Creech Air Force Base, how many of them are psychopaths. But I don't believe that the majority of them are. I think they got like Daniel Hale, they got sucked into the, the poverty draft. And I believe that someone like Daniel Hale would have been moved to more action sooner had he seen peace activists out there with messages of peace instead of promoting the the heartless assassination by drone missiles that is committed every day by US tax dollars. And the people that are being killed by drones that are being injured by drones, their, their communities are being terrorized by drones. They are the defenseless of the world. They cannot stand up for themselves. They have no, no chance to stand up for the incredibly powerful, oppressive US empire. They need us. They need us to be out there, to be a voice. And you may not think it's doing any good, but we, we feel this, this campaign can grow. And if we have the power to close Creech down for one day, that has the power to get our message out to the world and inspire people to really stand up against militarization, period, militarism, period. That's, we don't have a lot of time left. The, the US military is the largest user of fossil fuel in the world. If you look at all the thousands of cars that come into Creech, drive an hour up the road, burning all that fuel to murder people in other lands. We, we have to figure as a human race that we need to stop militarization. And the only way we're gonna do it is to get out the message that this is wrong. And we're communicating not only to the military but the people coming up and down the highway. Now I respect Brandon, you having a different opinion, um, but I don't see anything else happening in a significant way that's gonna stop the US drone program. We um, have the power to, 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 to actually unite against militarization, against drone killing, against all the violence. Our, Martin Luther King said the US is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. That was 60 years ago. It's, it hasn't changed, it's gotten even more violent. So none of the strategies that we've used so far is working. And we don't have a lot of time left. California is burning up. The planet is burning up. Um, I, I definitely know and acknowledge the points that you've made, um, but you're never gonna shut down Creech uh, because they've made enough changes in it that they can just put people in dormitory rooms and just have people cycle in and out of that. And they could just, you, they could shut down the outside of the base and still internally move. So you said that there were no strategies that have been working. Well, we have to find a strategy that does work because we are out of time. And one reason that I'm being hard and critical right now is because I see it as someone who has placed their soul upon the altar of damnation and have been vindicated and freed by my own personal actions. I know what the soldiers feel. I know exactly what they feel. One reason that I went and did what I did was because I met some Korean war veterans and Vietnam war veterans, and I didn't want my generation of warriors to be like them. I didn't want to be 40 years down the line and think sorrowfully of what I've done to participate in it and feel helpless and want to kill myself because I did go through that phase. I did go through the, holy shit, what the fuck is going on in the world? How come I participated in this? And why is it all falling to pieces? And one of my biggest criticisms of the Vietnam vets and the Korean War vets is why didn't any of them become politicians? Why are we, why are we not being you know, politically savvy? You know, these are the people that are profiting 
directly from not only the taxpayer money, but from lobbyists and kickbacks from corporations. They're the people that are making the policies. They're the people that affect our lives. They're the people that affect taxes. They're the people that affect all this kinds of stuff. And and what you're doing is you're you're going after the people that if you allowed them to make the right decision, they would. I fully trust that any soldier, that if he was supported to make the right decision, not for corporation, not for company, not for, for squadron or anything like that, but for his own personal soul, he would make the right decision if you gave them the opportunity. All the drone operators know what they're part of. They know what the, that they're part of the killing apparatus. They know that it's disgusting. They, they know what they see it. The ones that, that have a heart, that they got pulled into it because they had no idea what it was before someone like me came out. I remember when the recruiters were specifically recruiting drone operators from high school. They're recruiting video gamers, kids who have no idea, who've never lived apart from their parents, who have never seen the outside of their own small town. But because of the internet, they've been connected to certain things and developed a certain set of skills. And these are the people that, that you know, they don't have confidence. You know, they don't have the ability to stand up for themselves because they've been berated and kicked down and forced to t do what they've been doing. And I just don't think that, that, you know, vinegar is going to get a lot of them to your side. You're going to get a lot more of these flies with honey, you know, and I'm not trying, I'm not trying to, I I'm, tr I'm speaking from a very personal place. You know, when I first went to, when I went to Creech, uh, uh, for the first time since I got left there, left the military, um, I asked you guys not to put my face out there or my name. I just wanted to see what you guys were all about. And somehow everyone knew that I was fucking there. Like it meant, it made me, I didn't want to interact with people. It made me very self-conscious. It made me very scared because I've had so many people threaten me. I have a stalker that just is obsessed over me. And how am I supposed to maintain my own safety and my own integrity when I can't even trust the people that are supposed to be out there fighting to, to, to think about my, my care and my safety? How am I supposed to be someone who is inside the program and has valuable knowledge and can give you direct personal experience and feelings and thoughts and reflections of an, an entire community of people? How can I do that in a safe manner if I don't feel safe about the people that are supposed to be, you know, that want this information? Um, I'm not sure exactly uh, specifically what you're talking about because I know that you were invited to be part of a, a film showing. You and Sean Westmoreland came down. Correct, but I didn't. Called... I didn't ask. I did not ask for for people to put a flyer with my name on it out there. I asked. I, I was just there as a guest. Okay, and, I'm, I'm and, not and... quite sure what flyer you were referring to, and I'm not sure if I was at all aware of the flyer. Um, um, so, yeah, like yeah, I, and I apologize for, you know, I mean, we, we're humans, uh, Brandon, and uh, there's no reason why I would do something uh, that you had asked me not to do. You, I asked you about something already about this panel. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything personally about you, Toby. I'm talking in general about the groups of people that I've spoken to. Like, I will not let my name or the names of my fellow whistleblowers be manipulated into pushing an agenda because you know that's that's not what we're about you know in in your type of sense our goal is to you know find an actual direct solution where we can punish the criminals who are profiteering off of war and abusing our fellow soldiers and we are the link you I, I am the link for you to connect to them our whistle fellow whistleblowers are the link for you to connect to them and any criticisms that i have isn't personal it's just what i've observed and how we how i feel that we can make that deeper connection because sometimes we need to dig deep, you know, and sometimes we need to feel that little, little pain and a little shame to get us to push us a little further to get beyond that. And right now there's a lot of bad stuff going on. The drone operations are not going to quit because the U.S. pulled out of Afghanistan. You know, they're just going to move to another place. And if, and if we want to be effective as a team, you know, we have to be able to build those bridges to the people that, you know, that one or two poof, out of 900 people on base that are part of these operations, you need one person. You just need one person to stand their ground and to be like, you know, this is wrong. 
You just need one person because if you can get that one person, then you can get a bunch more people because that one person will be the one to bring a hundred back. And I totally believe that. Well, I'm hoping that Daniel Hale's actions have had a big impact on people in the drone program. Uh, one of the things we do at Beal, we have a much easier opportunity to actually have conversation with the mil military. Um, and we have educated a lot of young Air Force men in our conversations, educating them. A lot of the people at Beal don't even know that Beal is involved in the assassination program. They, they work, they're totally outside of the drone program at Beale Air Force Base and we have educated them and told them about the drone program and they're, they're appalled and shocked. So there's a lot of military education going on at Beale. It's much harder, harder at Creech because they are given strong orders not to even look at us. And in spite of that, Brandon, we are, in spite of that, we're not getting as much waves and peace signs as we used to in the early years because they're so strong about giving them uh, orders not to interact with us. But in spite of that, there are those in uniform that come out of the base and hold up that little peace sign. They give us that little wipe. We're there for those people to support. They, they know that we're on the side of justice and by them waving to us, they're communicating to us that they're on the side of justice. And I, that's I can't good. Move every psychopath that works at Creech Air Force Base. But I, I, we, what we can as a, as a people is we can uh, stop business as usual and tell the US government that halting the assassination at Creech Air Force Base for as long as we possibly can. If, if we could get 500 people at Creech, we could, we could turn that base upside down. And I see from Sean, uh, he's saying yes to my comments, I'm guessing. So that Sean Westmoreland is a drone whistleblower. So, you know, we can't get all drone whistleblowers to agree about what needs to happen. But uh, I would love Sean to, um, can we give Sean a voice? <laughs> well, um, Possible? I would just like to interject a moment and say that um, I'm grateful that Brandon has said he wasn't speaking to Toby personally, but Brandon, I know that what you said is something I need to hear. And I feel quite sure that many of us who are listening to you now know that there are times when we have used your voices and your courage to push our own agendas and we must slow down and ask and initiate the conversation and, and recognize that that's, that that's the rightful way to behave. In the chat that's been going on while you and Toby have been in dialogue, I, I sense a, a real longing on the part of many people to know, is there some common ground? You know, the, the old coffee house idea from uh, those who had protested the Vietnam War, or you had mentioned a bake sale would be a good idea, actually. You know, is, is there some, and of course others are saying, look, there are many different bases all across the United States and, and, and different vigils and actions and education outreach efforts take on a life of their own and they're not all cookie cutter. But uh, perhaps we, we we haven't a lot of time left, but um, could, could we ask, I, I hope it's okay if we ask Brandon and Toby and Brian to take time to, to give a, a closing comment and, uh, and, and recognize that this is certainly an ongoing conversation. And then also I wanna acknowledge with thanks all the people who have written to us in the chat. And I know that some of you um, have been together as whistleblowers for some time. So also with acknowledgement for the, uh, the long haul that that has represented. Uh, but um, Brian, I wonder if you would be ready to have a, a closing comment and then perhaps we could hear from Toby and then close out with you, Brandon, would that be okay? Sure, that'd be great, thank you. Okay, thanks, Brian. Yes, well, um, uh, thank you for, Thank you, Brandon, very much. I think uh, I think it's incumbent upon us uh, activists that we not abuse our our position. Um, the, the question we're asking is, who is the criminal? And the criminal is not the is is not the people driving into the base. The criminal, as you said, I, as I pointed out, that the CEO of Raytheon is a criminal. 
uh, the people who invest and and make their make 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 their money that way. I think that we have to. Um, I think sometimes we're tempted to act out of righteousness and out of to to deflect responsibility to say it's not me. I I. I am not responsible for the war in Afghanistan because I have stood up and I've been arrested and gone to jail and, and all of this. And I think that's, that's a very wrong way to use it. I think our activism, our acting, we have to go to these places, not because we are not responsible, but because we are, to, to, to claim our responsibility and to say, uh, not to say you are, you are the responsible one, but to say, I am along with you, along with everybody else. Uh, I am. I am in a very special way responsible. Uh, I'm certainly, as as a person of my generation, I feel when I'm at a base, I am, bear much more responsibility, uh, much more guilt even for for the war in Afghanistan, for the drone program, for the nuclear weapons I'm protesting, than. Um, the young people, as you say, who are looking to raise to support their families, looking for an education. Um, yeah, we have to act, act not because we feel like we're innocent, but because we know that we're not. Uh, so, uh, so thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Brian. And uh, Toby? Yeah, um, I would like to encourage if we could give uh, Garrett some time to come on Maybe he could be the last one to speak for a, a few minutes. Um, but um, I, I can say that one of the things that motivates me in my peace work is knowing that I have a, a fair amount of responsibility myself just because I paid war taxes all my life, not because I wanted to, they were taken from my wages. But uh, one of the, uh, we all have a certain level of blood on our hands. Um, but I have to say, you know, that I, I feel that there is some criminal responsibility by anyone who works in the drone assassination who's directly involved with killing people in this way. And so that there are, a, there is a level of criminality there that is undeniable. And uh, I, I feel sorry for the, the psychic injuries and the moral injuries that these operators are, are suffering from. And um, I don't know if there is possibility of being completely healed from those injuries once people get out of the program, but I would like to see the drone program stop the sooner the better so that more young people aren't gonna be uh, working for the US military and become damaged themselves. And, and so, we have a disagreement. I think it's a really important conversation to have. I, and maybe we can actually, maybe Veterans for Peace can open up uh, possibly an, a webinar in the future where we can have more conversation about this. Um, I didn't know that this is uh, what was gonna be the dominant uh, message or theme of your, your talk. So it, it was a surprise to me. I didn't have much opportunity to think about what I would say but it's a really health, healthy dialogue. And um, yeah, so, so thanks for your honesty, Brandon. Uh, thank you, I, uh, thank you, Toby. Um, I didn't really know what I was going to speak about today either, but I was woken up by the Irish Times sending me the updates on Kabul. Um, and uh, I feel like, uh, per Daniel's wishes that we speak not about him, even though we acknowledge our support of him, that we acknowledge what's going on and focus on that um, instead of our own personal egotism or uh, uplifting someone above the crowd. You know, what Daniel did was, was correct. Uh, it was standing up against the law. It was fighting against for what is right. Um, Brian Terrell, uh, said that sometimes we get lost in our righteousness about something. And I'd like to give you a, um, a term that I've learned uh, recently called militant decency. You know, we have all this anger, we have all this frustration, we have all this um, things that we're gonna try to, to fight against.
but use that anger to be the best person that you can, you know, love if, if uh, I know this is kind of like spiritual mumbo jumbo, but love only works on people who are acting unlovable. You know, it's easy to love someone that loves you back, but the people that, that you're right, this is a criminal thing. And the people that are participating in the criminal thing are just victims as well, but you need to love them. Um, you know, we are in a dire situation. We have a pandemic going on. The world is burning. I step outside and I can, can't even see across the street because there's so much smoke in my valley. Um, and I would love it if the drone operations in the military industrial complex shut down. I would absolutely love it. It's like the ideal, uh, uh, quintessential ideal. But what we have to do is be like, what are our steps that we can take in order to achieve that goal in our lifetime? And right now it's not about upsetting the drone operators because I feel like they're just tinder for the fire. Um, and we have to make sure that we love these people um, we need warriors in our society, and you are just as much a warrior for fighting for your beliefs as we are a warrior for fighting against our nation's enemies, you know. Um, and in order to be effective, we must have the same kind of spirit, you know, fighting for what is right. And that's the only way that we're going to succeed. That's the only way that we're going to get through this. And if we can keep that in mind, then I don't think that we'll will lose this fight. I mean, it might be a struggle. It might see some unexpected casualties, but in the end, I believe that we will succeed. Well, I'd like to um, thank each of the panelists and all of the people who have been with us throughout the past hour and a half. Um, Toby had mentioned hoping we might hear from Garrett. And so um, there he is. Um. Yeah, great discussion. I think this uh, this this has to happen more often, um, and I think we're going to have a lot of these discussions out at Creech. I'm going to go, and I hope a lot of people join me. You know, the the vigils uh, actions happen at dawn and at dusk, and that leaves a lot of time for conversation. And we can we can look at what our goals are. If our goals are are to uh, you know, contact and have conversations with drone operators, um, then maybe it isn't the most effective thing to do. If our goal is to, to shut down Creech Air Force Base, um, even for uh, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, however long we can permanently, um, then that's, that's a base that we can shut down. So, you know, we've, I think it just needs some analysis and uh, we have to listen to folks like uh, Brandon we have to listen to uh, Lisa and Sean, and uh, really importantly, what Brandon said at the beginning, we have to listen to folks who are victims and been harmed uh, by drone warfare that, are, that aren't here at the table today um, to have these conversations. But, um, you know, Kathy, I know you have connections and Lisa and Brian and Sean, you have connections and, uh, we could, we could get the hell out of the way and have an amazing panel of, of folks uh, in the Afghan diaspora and other nations that have been impacted by drones. And uh, I think that would, be, that would be amazing. And we could ask them, you know, what, what, they, what they need and what should we do. And I think that's, that's really critical, but I am going to Creech. I think these conversations need to be had with people who care about this issue and, and want to stop this, this terror to, from continuing. I'm not a drone expert. Brandon's a drone expert. Lisa's a drone expert. John's a drone expert. So I need them, you know, I need that community to help inform this discussion and inform me. And I need passionate activists, uh, you know, like Toby and all the creatures, uh, you know, to, to act as muscles. So we have to figure out how to effectively work together and work for the for the same ends, and uh, I think we all want the same things. We're just talking about different ways of getting there, and um, I hope we can figure that out. And I I I I can't think of a perfect setting to do it in the shadow of Creech Air Force Base to have these discussions. So, um, you know, I th I thought that bake sale idea is brilliant. You know, when we talk about organizing around military bases. Um, you know, even Colleen asked me, is, is there a bar, you know, across the street from the base that, that they go to? No, it doesn't exist in Indian Springs because they all commute. 
from uh, Vegas and they're dispersed in Vegas. So there's no centralized way, but if there's a centralized way we can get them to come to us somehow, um, maybe it's not Actually, a big uh, uh, Sorry to interrupt, <laughs> but there is a bar in Indian Springs and there, we have had a few opportunities to cross paths. Mostly the military does not go to that bar, but yeah. maybe we could find a way to encourage some of them to meet us there sometime. Yeah, maybe, or maybe the bake sale idea is is brilliant. We got to figure out a way, a centralized way, to bring them to us that that's safe and um, isn't uh, isn't something that that their commanders are going to shut down. But those com those those conversations, I think, need to happen. I I would like to have them in Creech, and uh, I hope folks still join us. And uh, you know, Brandon, I I feel some. I feel that you've been harmed and some others have been harmed and I don't expect you uh, to want to be there. But if I could take messages and I could be in contact with you, uh, I would love, love to be an ambassador of your, your interests and your opinions. Absolutely. Um, and uh, we can make this happen for sure. So um, I, I always respect you, appreciate you. And I remember that conversation we had, I believe it was at a, at a camp in Colorado. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, so superheroes, we got to stick together. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so sorry to interrupt because I think this is such a rich conversation and I love uh, strategy conversations, including when they get tense, because I think that they help bring us to greater clarity uh, around what is most effective. But we do have another panel that is supposed to start uh, 10 minutes ago. And so oh. I'm really, really sorry. And it's on the same account. Um, so we do have to cut it short so I'm, i um i apologize because I, I i wonder if maybe folks want to continue this discussion they could go into our social room and i can post that link um in or they you can see it on our vfp convention website um to go into the social room and you can continue this conversation um but we do have to start it for somebody else i'm so All sorry right. no can worries. i say Thank something you. very quickly um, for those who have the chat, there's a, a film that Brandon was featured in, the very first drone documentary. I posted the link. You can see it uh, free online, Unmanned America's Drone Wars, uh, to show the, the uh, courage uh, that Brandon had to be the first one to speak out publicly. Thank you. So thank you to everyone who's been involved. Um, uh, there's a great chat going on, a great day when we can have a big sale for, wait, I always get that one wrong, <laughs> um, when the Air Force will have to have a big sale to buy a bomber and uh, we'll have the money that we need to feed a hungry world. So thank you very, very much, all of you. Uh, you're being cheered on by young people in Afghanistan who themselves are trying to find the courage to over their fears. So be assured of that as well. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.